Hey, I'm Stefan Papadakis with Papadakis Racing, and we've got a really fun project right now. We've got the 2020 Supra, the one behind me. We've already pulled the engine out, and we're gonna try to make a thousand horsepower out of it. If you missed the teardown video, I'll link to that video in the description down below. So let's get started. Our goal is to take this 335 horsepower 2020 Supra engine and modify it to make a thousand horsepower on the engine dyno. Instead of just showing the parts we're gonna use, I'd like to share the process on how we decide which parts we replace and why. Also so you understand why these projects can take months instead of just days or weeks. I've also cut apart our current engine we use in competition, the four cylinder 2AR. That way we can look inside an assembled engine moving through the four cycles, intake, compression, power stroke, and exhaust. Again, this is not the super engine, but the concept is the same. Let's start with the intake. This is really where most of the power improvement is gonna come from. The camshaft turns and opens the intake valve as the piston starts its downstroke in the cylinder bore. In our case, since it's turbocharged, the air is fed into the cylinder with help from boost pressure. Generally, the more boost pressure, the more air we can squeeze into the cylinder. When we add all this air into the cylinder, we need to inject the correct ratio of fuel too. This is where you may have heard of air-fuel ratio. Too much air and not enough fuel and we will have a lean ratio. It will not make as much power as we would like and tends to run hot. We could actually melt engine components. Too much fuel and not enough air and we call this running rich. Also, it won't make the best power. We're actually looking for like the Goldilocks ratio. About seven parts air to one part E85 ethanol fuel measured in mass for your engineers out there. The factory fuel system does support good power, but not enough for a thousand horsepower. So we'll install six 2000 cc fuel injectors, one for each cylinder. We're also designing a completely new intake manifold that doesn't have the water to air intercooler. We're gonna mount a traditional air to air intercooler and my buddy Tyler over at Mountune has helped with that design. Not only has he designed it, but we've already started the 3D printing out of plastic to make sure that everything fits. And once we've confirmed that everything fits, we're gonna go on and probably 3D print it out of aluminum. The factory turbo will definitely make more than 335 horsepower, but it doesn't have enough airflow to make 1,000 horsepower. So we're gonna use the Borg Warner EFR 9280 turbocharger. It's much larger than the factory turbo physically, and it flows much more air, but that's at the expense of some low RPM torque. For our racing application, we're okay with that. We don't spend much time under 3,500 RPM. In order for us to mount the new turbo, we had to make a new turbo manifold. Sean and I reinstalled the engine into the Supra, I just bolted a bare head and block together for mock-up. We then figured out where we wanted the turbocharger and wastegates to live and built a fixture. The fixture is just a couple of welded flanges with some steel rods holding them in space, simulating the location of the flanges relative to each other. We then sent that fixture to Full Race in Arizona where they fabricated the turbo header to match the locations of our fixture. The Full Race guys build the headers for all of our competition cars. They hand fit the pipes and then actually machine weld them together for the perfect weld bead, but they still need to weld the hard to access parts. Once the piston approaches bottom dead center, this is the location where the piston is at the bottom of the bore. The cam allows the intake valve to now close, trapping the air-fuel mixture inside the cylinder. When the piston now travels up, the air-fuel mixture is now compressed into an ignitable density. It's hard to say that. We chose a compression ratio of 11 to 1. So the volume of the cylinder will become 11 times smaller once the piston is all the way up to top dead center. This is where the piston is at the highest point in the cylinder. Note that both the intake and exhaust valves are closed during the compression stroke. The spark plug will now fire when the piston is near top dead center, igniting the mixture, expanding the gases, and driving the piston down the bore. This is where the power comes from. This process also creates a lot of heat and pressure. The heat and pressure from the combustion process can sometimes surpass the limits of the factory components. We have decided to install forged pistons from JE Pistons. We have had great success using these parts for years. The aluminum pistons are forged in a giant press and then machined to a specific design versus most factory pistons that are cast, uh, which do a great job in the factory and even upgraded. But when you're trying to make three times the power, typically you'll go to a racing component like these. The engineering department is actually only about 20 minutes away from our shop. So I went down there to visit and discuss our B58 super engine project. I brought with me the cylinder head and the factory parts so they can scan them into the computer. Now that they had the digitized engine components and knew our eventual goals for the engine, they then designed a piston specifically for our project. The link from the piston to the crankshaft is the connecting rod. It's the connection that helps to turn the linear force of the piston, remember the piston just goes up and down on the bore, to rotational motion by the crankshaft. This is what we want. The rotation of the crankshaft is what turns the transmission and ultimately turns the wheels on the car to move forward. Although the factory connecting rods do look beefy, we're not sure if they can handle a thousand horsepower. And I don't wanna find out what the limit is because if you break a connecting rod, it's usually a catastrophic failure. You've junked the whole motor. 
We want to make sure to have a margin of safety in all the components. So I called up the folks at Carilla Rods, who are also quite local to our shop. We discussed the power we wanted to make, RPM we wanted to use, and the piston ring and pin weight. They need to know the piston ring and pin weight because not only does the rod need to handle the compression during the power stroke, but also the upward force when the piston changes direction at top dead center. It's going up and then really quickly it goes back down again. At 9,000 RPM, there are thousands of Gs of force pulling up on the piston, which try to stretch the connecting rod and the rod bolts. The engineers at Carrillo designed us a set of rods just for our application. The rods are made from a 4330M pre-hardened chromoly steel forgings. First, they roughen the piston pin and then the rod bearing bores. Next, they machine the shape of the rod in a big CNC machine. After that, they get checked for cracks with a process called Magnaflux. Then they're deburred and shot peened to relieve all the surface stress. After that, they're cut into two pieces where the rod bearing is going to be installed and the rod bolt holes are finished and tapped. Finally, they cut the bearing tangs, hone the bores to the perfect size, and they sonic clean them. The last step is where they measure all of the dimensions to make sure they're perfect in the temperature controlled inspection room. The crankshaft does look like it'll handle 1,000 horsepower, but it would be nice to have a longer stroke crank so we could stroke it to 3.3 or even a bigger displacement. But those cranks take four to six months to have built, and we just don't have the time to do that. Maybe we'll save that for like a stage two. Once the power stroke is completed, the exhaust camshaft opens up the exhaust valves, allowing the spent exhaust gases to exit the cylinder as the piston travels back up the bore. After the exhaust cycle, the whole process starts over again. Intake, compression, power, then exhaust. One thing I want to clarify though, in a four-cycle engine or a four-stroke engine, these are different names for the same type of engine. There are two crankshaft revolutions per combustion event, and the camshaft spins at half the speed of the crankshaft. Notice that the crankshaft timing gear is exactly half the size of the camshaft gear. In addition to making the engine strong enough to handle the power we want to make, we also need to make sure that the engine can breathe as efficient as possible. I took the super ahead to my buddy Tom at Port Flow so he could test the flow of the intake and exhaust ports on a machine called a flow bench. The flow bench simulates the airflow through the ports, past the valves, and into the cylinders. With this info, he can modify the port design to increase the flow and have less restriction. There is a delicate balance, though, between the size, shape, and volume of the ports and the valve and cam design. For now, we're going to do a pretty simple port job. We're going to do a bowl blend, which is where Tom will open up the port just behind the valves to increase the flow, and then also open up the exhaust port size a little bit on the two exhaust ports. The rest of the small parts, like hardware and bearings, I'll show in the next video when we do the final engine assembly. All right, so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button. If you want to see more, please consider subscribing, and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.